Welcome to the Accidental Safety Pro podcast. We are here live at the NSC Congress and Expo floor. My name is Jill James, and today my guest is Debbie Herzman, the president and CEO of NSC. Thank you so much for being with us. It's great to be with you, Jill. So you and I are the same age <laughs> and both worked in government for a while. Um, me with OSHA, you with the NTSB. Uh, my work was sort of regional, yours was national, oftentimes a world stage. Did we ever think when we were little girls that uh, safety would be in our realm? <laughs> and I'm curious to know, what was your accidental path to get you to where you are today and where you came in? Yeah, so uh, like so many people, when I was in college and when I was growing up, I didn't even know there was a job, you know, a such thing as just safety. And um, it really was by accident when I served as an intern on the Hill, then I went and I worked on Capitol Hill, and my boss was a senior member of the Transportation Committee, and so I ended up working on transportation safety legislation, and I really saw through accident investigations and looking at best practices and writing legislation, directing agencies to do regulations, that you could really change things for the better. Um, there was a train derailment, uh, actually a collision in my boss's district, and it resulted in the people on board actually burning to death because they could not get out of the train. There were train passengers, they couldn't open the exits to get out, and the emergency responders could not break the windows to get in. And it resulted in writing legislation after the investigation, understanding what happened, that changed how many emergency exits have to be, how they're marked from the outside so people can get in, and how they're, they have to be easy to open. And seeing that is really that example to me that safety is something that can change people's lives. And most of the time, people don't know it. They don't understand what's happening or what has been done to make them safer. Mm -hmm. But it was really the beginning of a journey for me that then on the legislative side and then to the NTSB and now at the NSC, um, it's been awesome. I've gotten an education in safety my whole career. Yeah. And so when you, did you have a hand in that legislation early on? I, I did. The yeah. train actually had originated in my boss's district mm -hmm. and he was uh, the senior member of the railroad subcommittee and so I had an opportunity to work yeah. with the NTSB investigators and that's where I really learned about NTSB. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of Frances Perkins story, the, the labor secretary and how she you know was observing what was happening at the Triangle Shirtwaist fire and then I, I often think of her as being sort of the, the mother of um, egress and emergency lights and exits and things because of what she observed and then what came after that and so maybe similar with you when we're when we're riding in trains and we think back to our roots and and how we had a hand on changing that arc that's yes. pretty fabulous that's yes. pretty fabulous and you know i think safety professionals probably pay attention to things that most people don't right. and so i am no fun to go on a vacation with or a trip with yeah. um you know i'm yeah. always telling my kids okay you know, this is how we're going to get out if something happens, mm -hmm. and this is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if we're on a boat that has a canopy, I'm like, just swim away from the boat, don't worry about us, you know, just get clear of the boat. And so pretty much nobody wants to go and do vacation with me because I'm always like, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that. I am so thrilled to hear that because it validates how I walk through the world, and I wanted to know the same thing about you, particularly with transportation. Um, just on my flight over, my my plane had to do like a hard restart like shut the computer down like unplug and plug it back in again see if everything works and so my safety eyes were paying attention to the exit lights that came on in the plane you know you you walk through the world differently and i noticed that every other emergency light came on and i thought I wonder if that's normal or wonder if we need to talk about that, like are half the emergency lights out or not, you know? I, I wasn't sure, but same thing and same thing with my kid as well. And we talk about situational awareness a lot and knowing our exits and do you have them accounted for? And so I'm happy to hear you do this, you do the same. And it's even just writing, wearing the right attire right? sometimes, you know, we're at the biggest annual safety show and surrounded by a lot of PPE and mm -hmm. other stuff, but I've got three teenage uh, kids and, you know, a riding mower, and I think about how you have to have the right equipment, you have to have the right protection um, all the time, no matter what you're doing, because there are risks, and um, it just makes me crazy in the neighborhood when I see people, you know, out mowing the yard in flip-flops or something, and um, I think 
people just don't know sometimes. And right, and make an assumption. Yes. Well, and then they're in a risky and unsafe situation. And so um, just not not disabling things that are supposed to protect you. And I think a lot of times people see some of those safety protections as a nuisance and they try to work around them. And we understand that the reason why those are there because people have either gotten hurt or they've gotten killed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and our job is to continually continually educate, though sometimes people are like, God, can you just stop being, my son calls me worst case scenario mom. Yeah. Mom, not everything is a worst case scenario. I'm like, except I've seen it. <laughs> so yes, I can. I, I know that. So in terms of uh, safety cliches, you've been at this a long time, I've been at this a long time, which safety cliches kind of get under your skin? Like you're just sort of you're weary of hearing them. I don't know. Tell me about, tell me about what years uh, but are. That's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the way we've been doing it for 30 years and nothing's happened. Yep. Like that one comes up all the time. Or um, it's just a 10 second job. I'm yep. only going to be there for just a few seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I would say the one that worries me the most is we're a very safe operation, or we have a great, or we have a great record. Because unfortunately, some of the worst things that I saw um, when I was at the NTSB for ten years were things where organizations had just received an award for having a, a great safety culture or having a great record, and then something happened. And I would say. That, um, that is just so devastating for any organization, but I think especially when organizations think they have you know, achieved something, uh, that then they can let their guard down. And I think for so many of us, we have to recognize that safety is a journey. There is no one right. destination for us to arrive at once and for all. There's one way to do it. Right, and you've got, and there's always going to be new hazards. The world evolves, your employees, your workforce evolves, um, and so just understanding that you've got to continue to be vigilant and, and not let your guard down. So NSC has a new mission, right? El eliminating, eliminating de deaths in our lifetime. Yes. Is that what it is? Eliminating preventable deaths in yes. our lifetime. So tell me more about that. So what? Um, what is that about, and how are you how are you um, supporting safety professionals in that effort? Absolutely. So many many organizations really um, make an effort to try to work to zero fatalities. Right. Um, they want all of their employees to go home safely. Uh, and at the end of the day, we are at the National Safety Council, kind of just a larger manifestation of that. And so when we say we want to get to zero preventable deaths in our lifetime, that seems like a really audacious goal. We right. have over 5,000 workplace fatalities in the U.S. every year, almost 40,000 fatalities on the road. But what we really want people to understand is we don't, we don't need anyone to worry about the big number. We're going to worry about the big number. We just want people to worry about their number. We want them to worry about if it's motor vehicle fatalities, worry about your family um, because you want that number to be zero if it's workplace fatalities, worry about your company. And if you work in a really big company and that seems too hard for you, worry about your, your site or your team because you want that number to be zero. And if everybody can achieve that mindset of how to eliminate those preventable deaths, wherever they occur, but focus on the small number, then we'll get to that big number. But um, I think that the biggest challenge that we have is really overcoming that where people feel like we can't we can't achieve these gains but we know we can yeah. in aviation um, until the southwest incident that involved um, the passenger being partially ejected yes. um, we had gone for nine years in aviation without a u.s domestic carrier fatality it's possible it is, yeah, possible. It is possible even if it's even if it's for a day or a week yeah. or a month you know, or a year or multiple years. That's that's where we want to drive it, but really helping people to understand. We know how to do the right interventions. It's hard. It is. It's hard. But we, we can do this using data, using best practices. We know we can. And the engineering this. control methods. You were pointing out yesterday in the opening session about the traffic fatalities just in the Houston area where we are right now and how many years it's been, you can compare and contrast that to aviation, like you're saying, and we know it's possible in one industry, and we know we can do it in the next with the right applications. That's right, and I, we're here in Houston, and Texas has not been a day 
without a fatality on their roadways since 2000. Uh, my oldest, amazing. yeah, my oldest son was born in 2000, and I just took him to college. And I think every single day for his life, there's been someone in Texas that's died. And you know, how do we start? How do we start with a city, you know, or a state, you know, and then the country? Um, we've we've had some states that have gone a month without having a fatality on their roadways, and really? so. Yeah, so we've got to celebrate those yeah, wins. And I don't think we talk sometimes about how many days that we've had where we haven't lost somebody. And, you know, I think how many workers, we often talk about how many days it's been since we've had a reportable injury. But what about how many days that it's been that we've sent somebody home safe or how many workers have avoided an injury because of the things that people have put into place? You're right, we don't have enough of those celebrations yeah. because our, our, our world is only when things go bad. And the rest of the time, safety is just kind of that nuisance, that coasting kind of thing, and there aren't enough celebrations. So I'm with you to be celebrating, celebrating the successes more so that we know that we're making a difference. And maybe that helps safety professionals have a bigger voice at their table, um, wherever it is they are. I'm curious to know about temporary worker safety. And um, is there anything the NSC is working on right now that can support safety professionals or that safety professionals should know about when they're trying to do what they can at their workplaces for temporary workers, which have such alarming rates of injury and death on the job? Yeah, so clearly you track the statistics and you know that that cohort is really at risk. And it's at risk for a lot of different reasons. A lot of times companies might be contracting out some of the work that's the most dangerous. Um, but you also are getting people who are coming onto your work site. English may not be their first language. There may be a lack of basic training in certain areas. And so the National Safety Council actually several years ago looked at this and we said, what can we do to try to advance best practices? And we actually worked with the American Staffing Association to create a program so that staffing companies can go through a process to see what OSHA best practices are and what industry best practices are okay. and say, what's that handshake that occurs between right. the temporary uh, employees, their, their association, their company, and then the host company? Mm -hmm. What needs to take place? Who's responsible for training? Mm -hmm. Where can mm -hmm. you find information? Who do you talk to mm -hmm. if you have a question? Um, yeah. You know, who's responsible for each part of that? So. It's oftentimes in anything that we do, mm -hmm. the handoffs, the shift changes, those things is, when it, is where where things get lost, yeah, right? Messy. Yeah. yeah, so you're making assumptions, mm -hmm. you know, maybe sometimes you're thinking, oh, they'll indoctrinate them or they'll train them when they get on the site, or maybe they're and thinking, the you other, did it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, so we have this program and it is really great because it allows companies to say, this is what we're gonna be responsible for, this is what you're responsible for, and this is how we both protect those workers because at the end of the day the host company doesn't want something to happen on their site and the um, the contract uh, employer the, the staffing association they don't want something to happen to their worker and so they want to be able to continue to deploy them as needed but you've got to have that right fit and um, and that's one way but there's a lot of ways that, that we can all make a difference but that's one way that the National Safety Council said at a national level how do we institutionalize mm -hmm. some of the national best practices yeah. and working working with an association was the way to reach multiple companies so say the name of the program again so people listening can know where they can go yeah so the American Staffing Association okay. and the NSC have a certification program and it's really a safety standard of excellence yeah. And okay. so it's how do you how do you identify best practices and and it, you go through an audit mm -hmm. and you, and you learn some of that. But well, that can be really empowering to the employer yeah. um, who's hiring the staffing agency when they're vetting if they have an opportunity to vet who they're going to contract with. Maybe someone who's willing to work with them or has gone through it on the other side as well. And that's what we really want is to create that as a differentiator to say, yeah. if you are trying to look at companies mm -hmm. and many times you're putting out bids and you're looking for things, you want a safe company to come on your property. You mm -hmm. want somebody who's using best practices. Mm -hmm. And so that can be a differentiator. And if enough host companies are saying, we want you to have this before you even come on site, yeah. 
then that gets the whole industry to lift up. Lift up that's right. And many times mm -hmm. it's host employers that are setting the standards. Yeah. And so understanding that that's out there is important. Very good. I think our listeners might be interested to know, what's the relationship like between NSC and OSHA? Um, you have an alliance together, I believe. But I think that safety professionals might just be interested to know, like, how does that work and what's the relationship like right now and how does that help the profession? Yeah, so uh, this is a, a great thing. We have an alliance with NIOSH, we have an alliance with OSHA, and what this really means is that we will work together cooperatively, you know, when it makes sense for us to do that, sharing each other's information. So, for example, OSHA campaigns like Safe and Sound, uh, Trenching Safety, they may have pushes at different points in time where they're trying to get more information out. Exactly, and so we'll work closely with them. We have 15,000 member companies, and so our reach, you know, is able to be a force multiplier for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. We can um, we can also use their excellent resources, and sometimes when new regulations come out, mm -hmm. we're really looking to OSHA to help our companies understand what to do. We've had webinars to talk about some of those changes okay. where they uh, speak to the companies mm -hmm. or are able to ask them, uh, you know, answer questions directly, and so. It's been a great process, but I'd say right now, one of the biggest challenges that we see, they don't have an administrator uh, exactly. at OSHA. And I, know, I keep checking the org you know, chart. <laughs> yeah, we, like yeah, we're two, you know, mm -hmm. kind of two years in at this point, yeah. and um, Scott Mugno has been nominated, but his mm. nomination is sitting mm. um, in the Senate and waiting for confirmation. Yeah. And so I think that that's really hard. And then looking at inspector uh, vacancies yes. and seeing at OSHA that they really need to fill those. Those are critical positions. And so, you know, our alliance is fantastic. It, it allows us to have a deeper communication with them, deeper connections. They attend our events and are, we're able to spread the message and make sure that we're giving out good information to support mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But we also recognize that they've got to be staffed appropriately. And whether it's inspection programs or the VPP program mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or other things that we might work together on, they need the resources to do it. And so we will actually even advocate for full funding for OSHA through you know, writing letters sure. to Congress and say, make sure they get their budget. Because um, mm -hmm. we need it. Yes. And, yeah, we and, need it. Know, it's important. What, yeah. what we have here and what we have is our member companies, mm -hmm. our companies that want to do the right thing, mm -hmm. companies that are committed not just to meeting the regulation, but exceeding it. They're, they're generally going above and beyond. Um, and, so, and it's wonderful when that happens. And yeah. 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 So you were talking about staffing levels earlier about OSHA, but staffing in safety in general is something that I feel a shift in um, with retirements that are happening from um, uh, many of the, the people who started out in the profession. My mentors were all men from the military years ago, and we're seeing, we're seeing this shift change. But we're also seeing um, like more and more people who don't have backgrounds in training in safety who are doing the work and they're good at it, but they're often like, like overwhelmed. Safety professionals are overwhelmed, or the people who get the jobs, like how, uh, how they can get educated, how they can learn more, and events like this can do that. Um, what other resources are out there for people who are just getting started and really want um, help on um, educating themselves on safety? What does the NSC have together, have for people just getting started? So I'd say one of the things that I've heard so often is um, when somebody is the accidental safety professional, yes. <laughs> yeah. you know, they, they might be in a different group or team and they also get assigned safety responsibilities. I was just speaking with someone who's retired um, but was here this week and is part of the Campbell World Class team. Mm -hmm. And they um, said when they were assigned safety responsibilities, one of the first thing that they did was come to an NSC Congress and Expo and be able to network and meet with so many other people and they said some folks just really took them under their wing and just adopted them yeah. but I will say we are facing kind of a, a cliff when yeah. we see a lot of experienced safety mm -hmm. professionals the ones mm -hmm. that are the mentors yeah. retiring and that's what and, I'm feeling right now yeah yeah for mm -hmm. sure and um, and, th and that is that is a challenge for mm -hmm. us as a profession yeah. but I think it's also an opportunity because we see safety being, again, distributed in other spaces. And when we talk about things like the opioid crisis, it's about working with HR professionals that may be responsible for the EAP programs and may also be responsible for what, it, what, what are the healthcare benefits mm -hmm. that allow someone mm -hmm. to get into treatment and mm -hmm. recovery. So understanding that 
As we start to deal with some of the big issues that in the past were seen as just the safety yeah. issues, mm -hmm. some of the latent issues or some of the contributing issues are not just within the safety team and having to work with other parts of the organization, but we know a lot of HR professionals are accidental safety they leaders absolutely, too. They absolutely and are. So and they're, they're, they're scrambling and trying to, like, they have so many other things to do and we're trying yeah. to teach them along the way as well. Um, and what about women in our, in our um, practice? I, I look at it as a STEM practice. And um, what, can, what can we do and what are you seeing um, with, by way of encouraging more women into, into the field? So it's a fantastic uh, opportunity for women. I would say I'm sure you agree with me. Yes. Um, I think it was to my benefit actually being one of the few women in transportation mm -hmm. and being one of the few women in the safety arena. I think I got so much support from my male mentors and male colleagues. They, they really lifted me up. Yeah. Um, so I, I felt like I had every advantage. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the same for, for everyone out there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when I came to the council, we actually established a women's caucus. It's part of our divisions. Okay. And so a lot of women are part of different divisions, whether it's transportation or construction or business yes. and industry. But we also said it would be great to have a place where women can come together. They focus on um, mentoring, they focus on professional development, mm -hmm. they look at opportunities. And so as an example, we've said, even on our board, I've said we want to recruit more women onto the board of the National Safety Council. And a lot of times that means you've got to think about how do you help people advance through that process? How do you give them speaking opportunities at events? Um, as an example, we had someone who was probably a little bit younger mm -hmm. speak at an event yesterday than, than probably we would have had, but it was a woman that, that had an opportunity that she, she probably wouldn't have mm -hmm. received. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of times you have to think about how do you give people opportunities? And I know that that made all the difference in the world to me yeah. when people said, you need to do this. Mm -hmm. And I know I looked sometimes mm -hmm. in the mirror and said, I don't know if I'm ready for this. <laughs> and Same. Yes. And there were a lot of yes. people that said, no, you're ready and mm -hmm. you should do this. And mm -hmm. I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially for the men out there, you know, really encouraging the women mm -hmm. to, to try something new. And yeah. I think women are very often anxious about failure. They yeah. don't want to let you down. They don't want to disappoint the team. And so they won't raise their hand to do something until they know they can nail it. It's, it's so true. Even asking women to be part of this podcast, and it's with absolute diligence that I have equal representation of males yeah. and females of, throughout, of, throughout the country on the podcast. And when I'm making an ask of a female, more often than not, they want to know a lot more about what I'm going to ask, what are we going to talk about. I don't want to get stumped up like wanting to make sure they know everything they possibly can and like we're just going to have a conversation it's okay um and so yeah i think we can we can certainly as as females be mentoring um i i know that i personally mentor a couple of of, of women who are younger and you know had to ask myself at a point in time am i a mentor now you know i've reached yeah. this part of my career like can i do that like is that is that like do I know enough to mentor someone? And, but it is really creating opportunities and speaking to experience. And um, but you know what, yeah. mentorship comes in all all forms. And I think you don't have to be senior in an organization. You don't have That's to true. you don't have to be uh, close to retirement to yeah. be a mentor. Mm -hmm. I, I've very often been mentored by people who report to me. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think um, you know we always have to recognize yeah. that we can learn from from other people. Um, it's, um, people have different life experiences, they have different backgrounds, they have different technical experiences, they have, you know, their educational backgrounds um, can be very diverse. And I think recognizing that, um, and, I, and I do think young people feel a lot more empowered probably than we did when we were junior to think, speak up. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think our millennials, I have learned so much from the millennial yes. generation. I, you know, I, I remember walking into a job early on thinking, oh man, the entire department is millennials and then there's me. How's this going to go? And I was like immediately blown away by their boldness, their yes. expertise, their yeah. wisdom. Yeah. And I'm, I was going to them and I'm like, this is just so, this is so great yes. what they're doing now. I think they are very bold mm -hmm. and I think that that can be, um, yes, and I think that can be um, a challenge sometimes cult culturally, yeah. culturally when you have different generations in the workplace um, but I think if you get to the point where you 
really embrace that opportunity, they they can help you up your game in a way that yeah. you, you know you really you you really don't know you need to. Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So with with the with the conference and expo, what do you look most forward? What do you look? What's your favorite thing, or what do you look most forward to doing when you're here, being part of? Well, I love to talk to people who are in the profession, and so just walking the show floor and getting to meet people and hearing about their experiences. But the speakers are so great. I was just at Corey Pitzer's uh, opening mm -hmm. this morning, his talk, and you know, I was taking pictures with my phone of his slides because I, there's, you, were you know, there's so mm -hmm. much to learn, and mm -hmm. I was like, that's what is so awesome about this profession. Yes is the knowledge is proprietary, the technology, the sharing, the systems, the processes, yeah. you know, even the catchphrases and the way that people are advocating for safety, they're always willing to share it. And um, I just feel like it's, it's, it's a fantastic, welcoming, inclusive profession. And you learn, you, you're, you get to be a lifelong learner. And I think whatever's going on in society, whether it's cell phones or fatigue or whatever, you get to experience it in the safety profession. And so a lot of what you learn isn't just about what you do on the job, but it, you can take it home with you too. That's right, we can apply it, we can probably agree. And you're so right about it not being proprietary. And that we're such a small cohort, so many of us even know one another, someone yes. who knows someone, and if we're so willing to share, and I think that's one of the exciting pieces of, of this career path, should people choose to do it, is that there's always gonna be helpers and to, to be able to support one another. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for being with us oh today. This has been so, so nice. Yes. Thanks for sharing your story. Yes. And thanks for making the time to be on the Accidental Safety Pro. People will love this. Well, thank you so much. I'm definitely one of those accidental safety professionals. And I think like that Robert Frost poem, you know, there's a path in the woods. Yes. And, yes. and I picked the one less traveled. And it has made all the difference for me. And I hope that there's, there's other people who get into this profession and love it as much as I do. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, if you'd like to join the Accidental Safety Pro and follow along with us, you can do that on the podcast player of your choosing. And if you'd like to reach out to us, you can email us at social at vividlearningsystems.com. Thank you for listening and thank you for the work that you do to send your workers home safe every day.